I want to start real quickly with uh, some, some definitions, uh, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I, we've all been here for a few days. We've all heard what Internet of Things are. I want to give these guys as much time as I can because I think they really have some interesting content. Um, one thing to mention is when we talk about IoT, um, we're doing different things with it. So uh, asset health is, is one thing, and I think you're going to hear a good case study from Shell on how they're, they're, they're using um, an IoT type solution, probably weren't calling that when they put it in, uh, to improve asset uh, uptime, which improves their operating performance. And then we've got uh, Dow that has got a logistics visibility solution, and I would say it's also sort of an environmental compliance solution. So we've got a, a, a second kind of feel to it, uh, safety risk and management. Um, and then we've got um, AGCO, which is um, really tackling sort of the risk management part of the supply chain. Um, so we've got three different approaches to visibility. We've got different types of IoT data. Um, but then I think one of the more interesting parts of our discussion is when we get to the end and talk about their vision for where they want to take this, uh, I think you'll hear some interesting things. Uh, I just want to quickly define um, uh, a supply chain control tower. Supply chain control tower is a central hub with required technology, organization, and processes to capture and use supply chain data to improve, uh, to, to provide enhanced visibility for short and long-term supply chain decision making. So this is, this is who's speaking today. We have uh, Jan Thiessen, Director of Strategy and Methods, Global Purchasing and Materials Management at AGCO. We've got Jeff Tazalier, uh, Global Leader, Auto ID, RFD, GPS, and Telemetry. I, I think it's now the Supply Chain uh, Operations Excellence. The Supply Chain Visibility Center of Excellence. Supply Chain, so that title has changed. <laughs> And we've got Tom Maroney, and I hope we got your title right there, Tom. It's VP Global Deep Water and Wells R&D. So with that, let's get right into it. Um, I thought I'd give uh, a few minutes for folks just to introduce their companies. So Jan? All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Tyson. Uh, I'm the Global Director uh, for Strategy and Methods in the Global Purchasing Team of ECHO. I'm pretty sure most of you have never heard about ECHO. It's a Fortune 300 company and we are in the agricultural machinery business, uh, mainly building tractors and combines and also other harvesting equipment. Um, company is just 25 years old, um, grew by acquisitions globally, uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it's about a 10 billion US dollar company and uh, we have basically five strong brands right now, which is Challenger, a former Caterpillar brand, uh, which has fanned our European or German powerhouse, which is more or less a premium brand within the company. Um, GSI, which is co something completely different, and this is what we are using to differentiate ourselves from our comp competitors. Um, it's grain storage, feeding systems, etc. And then we have two more brands, which is Massey Ferguson. Some of you maybe know the red tractors with the yellow wheels. Now it's more gray, but in the past it was yellow. Uh, maybe the oldest tractor brand on this planet. And finally, Valtra, which is a Scandinavian uh, tractor brand, uh, very strong also in South America. So we have global presence, 15 plants around the world, approximately 20,000 employees. And uh, yeah, we are spending quite some time and money currently on uh, increasing the visibility of our supply chain as 70% of our products are coming from our supply base. It's very similar to the automotive industry. Uh, so the success of our company is heavily depending on our supply base uh, so that we really need to invest in these relationships. And Jan, I, I know uh, you guys are also an IoT company, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, the first page you saw a lot of steel and iron, so we are very, a very traditional old ca company with old brands, steel and iron, so-called old economy. Uh, but the market is changing. So what our customers expect, expect from us basically is uh, that we are more and more getting connected. Um, a tractor is nothing else than, than a truck or now a car. It's, it's something like a data mine. We are collecting a lot of uh, data 
while using tractors and combines and the new approach is this connected farming or precision farming um, where we not only try to connect the different devices with the, with the hub but also now integrate different vendors, crop uh, vendors, uh, fertilizer co fertilizing companies and even maybe the end customers who are buying all that stuff from the, uh, from the farms. So the new trend in the agricultural business is uh, connected farming, precision farming. And uh, I attended an automotive conference last week uh, in uh, Germany. And I know that the automotive companies uh, usually think that they are ahead of the rest. But if it comes to self-driving uh, uh, machinery, self-driving cars, uh, connectivity, um, I guess the agricultural industry is now already ahead of what you know from the automotive companies. So really when you buy farm machinery part of that message has always been about yield but when you start to talk about sort of mapping your fields and uh, it really becomes a yield solution you're selling yeah absolutely i mean it's all about at the farms it's all about productivity a farm today is nothing else than just a, a corporation people want to make money people have to reduce costs and it's all about yield and uh running a successful operations and uh, we currently see that many of these farmers are investing also in technology that wasn't there five years ago so for us the market has dramatically changed we are even now selling drones because many of our customers now using drones to to understand the uh, the crop to better understand where where there are issues with with the crop and uh, really to start targeted initiatives thank you Ian. We're going to move over to Dow, and, and Jeff is going to walk us through Je uh, Dow a little bit. Good morning, and uh, glad to see a, a few faces here after the SeaWorld excursion last night. So uh, a quick overview of, of Dow Chemical, and I think most of you are, are familiar with us. Um, the, the numbers in the slide are a little dated. Um, we just uh, closed our, our fourth quarter and year end uh, with another great year. Um, when we look across uh, the businesses within Dow, it's a, a very diverse um, organization. So uh, from a supply chain standpoint and supporting these organizations, uh, many different uh, solutions and requirements from our, our ag chemicals um, and, and seeds business, which uh, may have a, a package the size of a, a small uh, uh, pill package up to uh, a rail car and a, a bulk marine vessel uh, across the, the various uh, uh, business entities. Within our supply chain center of excellence, uh, we support all of these businesses. We sit in between uh, our supply chain uh, leadership in each business, uh, our IS organization who are supporting the various solutions. Uh, as well as our logistics function, which is, is tasked with the day-to-day -day operation of, of moving products around. And so our, our organization in the Center of Excellence is, is looking at uh, what are those innovative solutions, more of an outside-in approach uh, to uh, supply chain and, and leveraging best practices from other industries, working with our customers um, in, in joint collaboration and, and moving transformational technologies forward. Um, the one caveat of this slide is it will change drastically over the next 18 to 24 months, um, which will provide opportunities within our supply chain organization, um, as well as challenges. Thank you, Jeff. And we'll do a, an introduction to Shell Oil as well. Great. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, fresh from uh, the Netherlands uh, as of yesterday evening, uh, but I'm glad uh, the logistics worked out. So just a few comments on Shell. Uh, obviously, I think probably all of us are familiar with the uh, brand and the retail service stations, uh, the yellow pectin. Shell is one of uh, a few of the major integrated oil companies. Uh, depending on the metric, we're, you know, one of the top, in the top three, with the other uh, folks that we compete against in that space, obviously being ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, and Do Total. In terms of, uh, you know, just in terms of some statistics, right, the company produces three, over three million barrels of oil equivalent on a daily basis, which represents roughly 2% of global supply. Uh, we have a retail fuel network of roughly 44,000 
service stations through which we sell transport fuels to over 10 million customers a day. In our LNG business, liquefied natural gas, we deliver roughly 30 million tons per annum. We're active in over 70 countries and roughly 90,000 employees. Now, I think if you had a bumper stick sticker that would have described Shell, it is about technological innovation and major project deliveries. So as I said, we are a major integrated oil company, so that means it's the combination of upstream operations, which is all about the safe exploration, production, and retirement of assets. And then it's the downstream businesses where those products are, where the, that raw product is, is uh, converted into uh, a variety of fuels uh, that is sold uh, to uh, a, a, a landscape of customers. The picture here depicts just one of our upstream integrated production systems. And this is where we begin to think about the challenges that we face in optimizing those assets on a daily basis. The deep water is the line of business that uh, I am responsible for from a technology standpoint. And the deep water business obviously is major capitally, uh, capital intensive. So again, it is a all about uptime, maximizing throughput, that entire chain from subsurface all the way through sales point into our downstream operations. Great, thank you. And, and then I, the, the question I posed of uh, all three gentlemen is if, whether they could talk a little bit about the scope of their supply chain visibility project that is, uh, is under discussion today. Yeah. Uh, in the past, ECHO has been uh, led very decentralized, so we had different brands and uh, the owners of the company were running the company more a little bit like an investment uh, uh, company, um, which created a few challenges for us in the purchasing organization. So there was no communication at all between the different entities, between the different teams. Uh, we had the same suppliers, but nearly no visibility, no transparency on the on the performance, um, so everything was based on technology and sales and uh, purchasing was more or less a priority three or four in the organization. So uh, we, we, uh, had a new, uh, we brought in a new leadership team uh, in 2011 and we decided let's, let's transform this organization more and more into a real purchasing team, into a real global purchasing organization, leveraging volumes, leveraging know-how. And while we did that, um, we, of course, also attacked different areas where we felt not comfortable with. This was mainly the area of supplier management and supplier development. And part of that initiative, of course, is also the area of risk management. Um, we had a few cases in, in the past, uh, earthquakes, uh, floodings, etc., uh, where we really suffered from. So in 2012, there was an earthquake in... Um, in it, northern Italy, uh, which resulted in, I would say, 2,000 tractors without wheels and tires. So we even had to rent space to put all the, the work in progress. Um, so we made the supply chain risk management part of our strategic initiatives in that transformation uh, process. And when we decided to do that, uh, we said, don't let us make the same mistake many automotive companies did five, six, seven years ago when they uh, had this crisis and when they all went to whatever kind of provider to build up a so-called risk management. I was, I was in automotive for 10 years and I was part of this group uh, making this mistake. Um, so we at that time decided, hey, the economy is going well, uh, the company is doing well, let's really start with the fundamentals and our strategy basically is, and not only in this area but in general, before we think about implementing tools that help you to create transparency or visibility, let's do a few things first. Let's build a foundation. So we developed an approach and that was our scope basically. First of all, let's clean our house. Uh, let's make sure that we are not creating risk within our, or within our organization because we do not talk to, uh, with each other or we, we don't know what others are doing. So we 
uh, basically started a transformation process where we developed this global uh, purchasing organization with clear roles and responsibilities. And we also made it very clear to everyone in the organization that if you are a buyer, a purchasing leader, your job is not only to deliver cost savings, your job is to um, minimize risk to make sure that we're not ending up in another situation like Northern Italy or others. Um, then we, of course, needed to understand our supply base. Yeah, we, had, we have all, right now around 5,000 suppliers in our supplier uh, list. Way too many suppliers for a company uh, that is basically producing two major products, tractors and combines, but that's also a legacy from, from, from the past. Uh, then, and after we did this fund foundational work, we decided let's think about systems. How can we automate uh, this process? How can we make life easier for the people in the organization? How can we use external knowledge um, to understand what's going on in the market? Um, so that finally we ended up uh, with a system in place um, or different systems in place that now help us to, to really control our supply base to understand are there any risks within the supply chain financial risk, geopolitical risk, environmental risk, compliance risk, and others um, that help our commodity leaders, our purchasing leaders, really to make the right decisions based on performance, based on risk avoidance. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll take it to Dow now. Great. <clears throat> so Dow started this journey uh, of supply chain visibility over 10 years ago. Um, and, and as you see from that first slide, it was largely driven by security um, as, the, as the priority. And so we've built out a, a very robust, um, for our TIH or toxic inhalation hazard products, uh, supply chain visibility solutions uh, for rail cars as, as well as our ocean, ocean cargo visibility. And there's a, some additional slides on those uh, as we move forward. Um, approximately six years ago, uh, Dow embarked on a, uh, uh, an ERP uplift, um, and as part of that, uh, spent a, a good portion of, of the last uh, several years uh, upgrading SAP to a common platform globally. Uh, as, as part of that initiative, um, in coming out of that initiative, it was uh, quickly determined that uh, we didn't have the visibility outside of our fence line that we required. Um, so we would often get from our, our business leaders uh, phone calls from customers saying, where's my stuff? It, it was supposed to be here yesterday, and it's somewhere in transit. Well, after a, a, a day of emails and phone calls with our carriers and multiple carrier partners from a multimodal standpoint, uh, it was very clear that we needed to take action and, and fill um, and get visibility into those gaps. And so. We've built a, a multi-generation plan. Um, I think yesterday the common theme was this is a journey. Um, the technologies exist, uh, as you see in those first two bullets. Um, the challenge we have is, is how much data is enough. And, and we hear, yeah, we want real-time data. Um, we're, we're in the process of a, a road visibility solution today. The number one requirement was road visibility. Well, if I turn on GPS tracking across 48,000 shipments a month, that's gonna overwhelm our logistics and business partners. So, so how do we take the, the opportunities that we're seeing and that have been uh, um, built in the, the process and automation world and apply those into supply chain? And so part of this multi-generation uh, visibility plan um, is, is adopting those similar principles uh, over into supply chain. And, and so the, the bottom bullets, uh, we've in, embarked and we're continuing to expand across the various modes. And uh, rail visibility, uh, we've, we've overlaid uh, some additional analytics capabilities from a, a dynamic on-time delivery and, and overlaying weather patterns. Um, looking at uh, and, and implemented a marine pack cargo uh, visibility platform so we can see in transit um, where that product is. Um, today, those are largely, uh, at least the, the marine pack cargo solution is largely based still on uh, B2B communication and EDI. Um, but we have the roadmap to get to real time, and you'll see some technologies there. Um, as part of this underlying uh, 
uh, strategy we see moving down into more real-time solutions. So one of the largest challenges we have uh, is the accuracy of that data uh, and the reliance on our uh, logistics partners uh, to provide that data accurately. Um, so uh, continuing to move down, uh, ultimately uh, building that uh, control tower, um, and, and we've uh, experienced and, and saw a number of different solutions. Um, uh, and, and yesterday we saw the, the work that our, our team had done in Oyster Creek and, and some of the, the opportunities there to leverage their designs. Um, and then ultimately moving uh, to more supply chain automation and, and where can we take uh, some of these routine activities uh, throughout the supply chain and automate those uh, through software and, and dynamic uh, triggers on the edge. Um, one thing I, I do want to note, when we look at, at supply chain visibility, it's, it's more than just logistics. Um, so the, the long-term strategy is how do we pull in supplier collaboration and, and risk management, um, looking at event management, and, and how do we um, more quickly react uh, or predict events and use those opportunities, such as a, an explosion in, in a port in China, to grab market share and, and move to a more strategic business uh, opportunity rather than just a cost center for, for our corporation. Um, and then also moving down into that demand signaling through uh, real-time technologies and embedding those into smart and intelligent products at the edge. Thank you. And, and finally, we're, we're going to get to Shell here, I, I think. Yeah, okay. So the scope of our control tower solution uh, is in the deep water line of business. Again, one of our major uh, upstream lines of business. What we're looking at here on the, on the slide is our Gulf of Mexico theater of operations. So for deep water, we've got uh, four large uh, operational theaters around the globe. In the Americas, uh, excuse me, in the US, it's the Gulf of Mexico. Down in Brazil, off of Rio, the western coast of uh, Africa, Nigeria, Lagos, and then uh, in Asia, it's, uh, it's in Malaysia. But now just zooming into the Gulf of Mexico, just a couple of statistics to, uh, to describe, again, the scope of the, of, of the operational in intensity that goes on uh, there. So we've got seven floating, two fixed structures. So if we go back to that slide that was up previously, right, that, that that picture was just one of those assets, right? So we've got uh, nine, seven floating, two fixed that we operate. So that means shell personnel are ha at the hands of the helm of those assets. Uh, there are three other assets that we have an interest in, but our personnel don't operate, all right? So those are non-operated ventures. So in total, a dozen assets, multi-billion dollar investments seven drilling rigs in operations. So these are offshore drilling rigs, uh, seven, that's probably uh, down a little bit uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in Brazil, we've got two floating uh, production systems. Connected to those host structures are approximately 300 to 350 wells that are producing over 600,000 barrels of oil equivalent. So that would include gas, right, just converted uh, uh, to oil. On any given day, there's roughly 2,000 to 2,500 uh, shell staff and contractors offshore, 35 offshore support vessels, and, uh, and 10 helicopters in operation. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a fairly large uh, logistics materials management operation on top of the operational dimension of running 300 to 350 wells and then all of the processing equipment uh, on those floating production systems, those host structures. So Steve, the, the scope of our visibility was again looking at the deep water, extremely capital intensive, in, intensive. how can we further improve the ROI? So we set out on this journey thinking about you know, some, some uh, practices, procedures that are fairly well rooted in operations, right? Control, uh, the safe op operation of equipment. We wanted to shift that further into our engineering sector. 
so that we could further optimize these assets. So we thought about what engineers do on a daily basis. We thought about all of the activities, the engineering calculations, the models that, that get run to look at that integrated production system from the subsurface, the reservoirs, the connection to the wells, all the way then back up to all the processing equipment. How can we ensure that on any given day, at any given second, that that equipment is being fully utilized at maximum efficiency levels? Obviously, uh, equipment's going to wear down. Uh, there are going to be issues with wells potentially standing up. And so we saw an opportunity through analytics, through automation, where we could step up uh, and standardize a lot of those analytics through the use of the computers, through the use of concepts of Internet of Things, and bring all that information much more forward in real time, the analytics forward in real time, and prevent anomalies from happening, throwing equipment offline or taking a well down and causing uh, 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 large pieces of that production system to be offline for hours or days or weeks until we can get in and do the proper uh, remediation activities. So that was the thrust of our visibility tower. It's a large uh, center in New Orleans where all of uh, our assets in the Americas, so Gulf of Mexico and Brazil, are brought together and optimized in real time on a daily basis. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I've already heard a, a little bit of a common theme, which is both Dow and Shell doing some, some thinking about what operators need to see uh, in order to do the, their job. So. Um, so I think we may have answered this at least partially when we were talking about the journey, uh, but I'll throw it out there again, um, you know, uh, and, and maybe it's a, just a very quick uh, answer uh, on your part and we, we go on to the next question. But the question was, why did you feel the need for a visibility solution? And I think it's been partially answered already. So, yeah, Jan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a few comments on that. Um, if you if you really want to make your supply chain visible, you really need to understand what are the r potential risks you are facing. And um, I, I mentioned earlier, seventy percent of our products are coming from suppliers, suppliers from all around the world. So we have pretty complex supply chains. Uh, we are having just-in-time manufacturing in some areas. We even have just-in-sequence, like the automotive people. So we need to do something to really understand the performance of our supply base and potential risks. And when we continued with our approach, when we were in the phase to select different providers, uh, we spent quite some time internally with our friends in manufacturing, engineering, uh, quality to really understand what kind of risks are we facing and what kind of risks do we have to manage. So uh, for us it was important that people again understand risk management is not just buying a tool or uh, asking suppliers to be more transparent. Uh, it is really a mindset change and that's one of the reasons why we involved our cross-functional partners during the phase of um, risk identification and we did a few workshops uh, we did uh, we did a few uh, sessions with these people so that at the end of the day also people outside the supply chain organization understood that if we want to manage risk proactively in our company they need to be part of it um, I know I'm repeating myself but again it doesn't make sense to to Pay, pay money for tools to pay money for a uh, for a network and, and we do that now uh, we have strong partners and I guess we come to that a little bit later but before we spend money on that we wanted to make very sure that everybody runs into the same direction that everybody is pulling the same strings to make this approach successful thank you and Jeff oh I guess you had another slide oh, there yeah, right, right. so Good. yeah <laughs> Okay, then I will uh, spend a little bit more time now on the uh, on the technology. Um, so the direction we have put in place uh, uh, almost two years ago was um, risk management is something you need to do, or supply chain risk management is something you need to do with strong partners. Uh, we are an agricultural company. We 
understand our suppliers, we can measure the performance of our suppliers, and we do measure the performance of our suppliers to help us to make the right decisions. But if it comes to other kinds of risks, geopolitical risks, environmental risks, supply chain risks, we are maybe not the experts. So we decided two years ago, basically, um, that we need to do something on the technology side, and we need to buy technology, and we need to buy content. Um, so the, what we did basically is uh, we, we screened the market, we uh, did uh, um, many, many RFIs to understand what's on the market right now, and we teamed up in 2016, 14 with a company from Germany which is called Risk Methods, and they are experts in the area of risk management. And what we're doing with Risk Methods here is um, we have our supply, uh, supplier database uh, uploaded in their in their system, and we spent quite some time on cleaning up the database first, uh, which was even more more difficult than uh, ramping up the system. And with that database, we are currently monitoring all our 5,000 suppliers in terms of compliance risks, uh, uh, geopolitical risks, environmental risks, and whatever is out there on the market right now, um, to better understand if there's something coming up. Um, do we face challenges in the area of supplier insolvencies, financial issues with the supply base? Um, we, we have teamed up with one strong partner, which is, which is risk methods here. Um, but we also have said, if you want to really understand your risk exposure, you need to um, connect to more sources. So what we have done basically to make this happen, uh, we have implemented a global web-based supplier management system. Uh, which you see on the on the left side, where you see this demo corp. This is our Echo web-based system, um, where we track supplier performance, where we tra where we run uh, manage our master data and all everything related to the supplier. But all the sources we now have connected to, like risk methods, like Dunst and Bradstreet for the financial part of the risk management. Um, and some insurance companies, we are pulling this data out of their system into our system so that our people, buyers and leaders, just have to go into one system to get the full picture, the full visibility on our supply chain on, on this particular supplier. This is from, from internal uh, uh, um, aspects like performance management, so we track quality, we track uh, on-time delivery, we track commercial uh, compliance. Um, to make sure that we that we really understand, do we have the right suppliers, or do we need to start some kind of uh, supplier development initiative? And on the same page, you will also see um, the we call it risk scores, financial scoring, uh, so that we really have an understanding about this supplier in in all aspects and. Um, what you see in the middle, basically, uh, it's a smaller picture there, is, is our supplier network. It's now the first time in our history that we know the material flow. Wh where, is the where is the supplier located and how is the material flow, for example, from China to, to Europe or from China to the US? And um, with this, we also can monitor different ports and logistics hubs so that if there is an issue going on in one of the logistics hubs in China or in Europe or in the US, we know it early. Uh, we're screening with this solution, we are screening more than 10, million, uh, 10 billion uh, web pages. Uh, we are connected to different kinds of uh, databases um, through risk methods. So they are connected to, to compliance companies like Ecovadis, which is uh, very much focused on, on compliance and, and uh, environmental stuff, um, to insurance companies that usually have a quite good understanding about risks uh, on this planet. Um, so basically, it's not only about monitoring a supplier, it's more about monitoring the supply chain and the material flow from point A to point B uh, to better understand is there something coming up, yes or no. And this is, this is used by our buyers now to make decisions, and we are now putting algorithms in place to better understand internal, or to connect internal performance, quality logistics with external performance, so that in the future our predictive analysis will be much better than it is right now. So uh, if there is a correlation between quality and um, maybe financial stress, uh, we will early see if there's a supplier 
in a difficult situation or if something will come up in the future. So, so Jan, there's one thing I want to press on. I, I'm going to describe the solution, and I, I hope I describe it correctly, and then I'm going to ask for a little bit of an explanation. So you've mapped your supply chain. You, you've mapped your most important suppliers. Yeah. You, you've mapped how this flows into your factories, what ports it flows through. And then you, you're, you're, uh, the risk method thing is looking at 10 million sources of data. So let's say you've got a supplier in Brazil. Um, and they go bankrupt. You want to know it now instead of at the end of the month. So I, I guess before we get into that, because I know that's a real example, but, but how does risk methods do it? Do, do you put in the word bankruptcy in, on each of these 10 million pages? Do you put it in Portuguese? Do you put it in French? I mean, how do you make sense of web scra scraping 10 million sites? Yeah, I guess you, you, you took the example insolvency, which is the most difficult part of the entire risk management uh, environment. Um, to really understand if a supplier is in financial trouble, it's, it is difficult right now, it was difficult in the past, and it will be very difficult in the future, because here we really have to rely on external partners, on the accuracy of their, uh, of their balance sheets, of their reporting. Um, this is always pretty, pretty uh, difficult to, to predict um, if there is a financial issue coming up. But if we talk about other risks like, uh, let's say, geopolitical risks or even strikes, and we had some cases in Brazil in the last couple of months, um, this, they, uh, the company Risk Methods, they have created a, an algorithm that is screening this 10 billion uh, web pages uh, um, a day. They are connected to whatever kind of warning systems in the background. Um, and basically, and we had that with, with a strike in Brazil, within 60 minutes, we knew that there was a strike in the Sao Paulo or in the Sao Paulo area in the ports. And we, 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 we got it through an alert system. So there are alerts coming to, to us. Uh, we have a, let's call it control tower in, in our headquarters. So we're getting these kind of alerts. And then we are activating our teams um, to find, to work on solutions. And this is what basically, uh, part of, of my team, um, we consider ourselves as a control tower, but we also consider ourselves as the, uh, as the consulting team and management team to resolve these issues. Um, the good thing here is um, what we do right now, we cannot do ourselves. We do not have the IT expertise. We do not have the, uh, the content management expertise. So that's one of the reasons why we need to have a strong partner. And um, the information is out there. It's not only the web. As I mentioned earlier, there are many, many agencies on these companies that are tracking whatever kind of risks and whatever kind of developments. And the art uh, of, of risk management really is to, to bring this information together and to make sure that uh, the alert function is running well so that you get the information early. Okay, thank you. And I, I, we got a little bit out of order, so, um, but, um, so, uh, let's go to Dow. We've already talked a little bit about why visibility, so let's talk about the kind of uh, sensor, the volume of sensor data you're generating. And um, so, yeah, let's, sure. let's take a step. Sure. At that. Before I go uh, into this one, I wanted to yeah. come back. You had asked why supply chain visibility, and, and I would echo the, the traditional risks, event management yeah. uh, in supply chain, uh, reducing costs and the various levers. Uh, that we can uh, um, engage and, and pull uh, to do that, uh, improving service. But uh, another piece I would say is the Amazon effect. Um, I don't know uh, how many of you are in supply chain, but I would say at least once a week, I, I get a, a business leader coming to me and say, well, Amazon can do this on a pair of socks, and, and they can give us all of this visibility and all of this technology. Why can't we do it when we're shipping a 38,000 uh, gallon tank of uh, pick your favorite chemical. And so um, the expectations there from the, the consumer and, and retail side are, are backing in uh, to um, the chemical industry. And so um, we fundamentally know we're not there yet. Um, we also know we have to get there very quickly. The, the variability and the risks um, continued uh, to increase their pace. And so we need to be more agile and more flexible in our supply chain 
uh, to get these products to our customers. Um, and, and once again, I, I come back to making that transition from a, a cost organization uh, uh, tasked with how do we get it there the cheapest to uh, a strategic organization. And, and you look at the, the large retailers and their supply chains and, and that that's their uh, some of their core capabilities. And, and so rather than supply chain being an afterthought, actually getting a seat at the table and, and helping to drive those strategic discussions. So um, th there's a, a fundamental change that takes place there uh, in the organization to do that. Um, so what kind of sensor data? Um, and, and this is just a sampling. Uh, this, uh, fortunately, in, in the US, uh, we have a, a, a very robust uh, RFID system within uh, the North American uh, Railroad. And so uh, on the 20,000 plus uh, Dow cars, and this changes a, a little bit based on, on our current footprint and, and uh, some of the activity we've done, but uh, we're, we're pulling in those 20,000 uh, uh, car location messages or CLM messages into a, a, a dashboard, um, pulling them through our, our rail visibility system, attaching um, uh, various data elements. So what is the not just here's a, a car mark in its location, but also the, the contextual information. Um, what customer is it going? What's the uh, delivery date or anticipated delivery date? Um, who is the carrier of that particular car? And so we can start to run the analytics on performance of specific routes. Uh, we can look at dwell times in certain switching yards. Um, we can overlay weather. And so these are just a, a couple of snapshots um, of the of the various dashboards that our rail team has available. Um, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier on our, our toxic inhalation fleet, um, we have GPS tags with, with various sensors uh, on them. So uh, uh, based on whether a, a car is going through a high threat urban area, um, we'll uh, increase the ping rate on that so we have more granular visibility. If a hatch goes up in a, a high threat urban area, um, we can take the appropriate action. If a hatch goes up at a customer, um, we know it's been delivered. Um, so there's, there's some additional capabilities there as we move from a, a security mindset of where's my stuff to how do we utilize this for supply chain efficiency and, and automation. So uh, just one example here of, of rail cars, but uh, I think it gives a flavor of, of the capabilities and, and we're uh, on the, the GPS side of it, we're looking at what are additional sensors we can uh, uh, include on these rail cars. So is a handbrake on or off, uh, which can lead to, to degradation and um, uh, issues. Uh, looking at bearing heat, um, so on, on the actual uh, rail car itself, which can lead to derailment. So there's a, a lot of additional sensor capabilities once you have the backhaul technology there to get that data back into your systems and, and the analytics then to run from a maintenance and repair standpoint as well, so. Yeah, no, this, this is great. And we had Jan say uh, they're looking at 10 billion web pages. Um, what are we talking about in terms of data generation for you? Is this uh, half a terabyte a day? Is it a terabyte a week? Uh, do, maybe I shouldn't have asked this without checking with you first, yeah. but do you have yeah, any idea? I, I don't on this one, so. Yeah. Um, it it really depends on where those those uh, rail cars are. Um, yeah. I would say largely we're we're managing this in a a hosted solution, so uh, uh, software as a service uh, outside. So um, we're not bringing this within our our own data center and, and managing mm -hmm. that data internal. Uh, once again, relying on our our partners and and walking through the security aspects and all of those things as a, a chemical company will do, but not pulling all of that data in. So letting and, and utilizing the vendor from a, um, they have the sensor capabilities, they manage those devices. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, things as simple as, as battery maintenance and how many pings we, we actually need to get and, and creating those algorithms. I don't need to know a rail car is sitting there. Mm -hmm. If it hasn't moved in, in 12 hours, I don't need 800 data points to tell me it didn't go anywhere. So, yeah. so these are the 
kind of the data management where we work with our partners. We know what data we need. We know when we want to see it in motion. Uh, we know when we want granular data. So, um, you know, we try to remove the how much data are we collecting. We want the, we want the business information. I'm not as worried about the data. Right. And one way to deal with big data is just make it somebody else's problem. That very true. <laughs> Um, and Tom, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what um, Shell is doing as far as um, sensor data and, and all of that. So right, okay, Steve. So let's let's start start by taking a uh, taking a look at at the solution at, at least uh, diagrammatically uh, how we've architected uh, the solution that underpins this uh, control tower for our deepwater operations covering the Americas uh, theater. Again, the objective here was to extend uh, traditional operational control room monitoring into the engineering sector, bringing forward all of the sophisticated analytics, operationalizing all of that in a very, very much in a continuous real-time manner, right? So we wanted to move away from having a, 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 a system that was highly people-dependent and waiting for someone to turn on their computer, download data, put it into the latest model, run calculations. We began to look at all this, get very routine, standardized sets of analytics that we saw the potential of putting that into high performance computing and driving that analytics and removing the personnel leaving the personnel then available to do the diagnostic interpretation of the analysis and that's really where we get the value out of the personnel right that was another driver mm -hmm. of this so again if we look at uh, the slide here diagrammatically how the system works uh, we've got a uh, again uh, a large lump number of instruments outfitted with sensor data somewhere around 16 to 17,000 pieces of equipment that we're monitoring on a daily basis. We bring all of that in into a fairly sophisticated uh, alarm analytics engine. Uh, it's up here referenced as ECM or Equipment Condition Monitor. And in the bottom there you see uh, you know, one of the analytics architectural diagrams showing the data map to a series of calculations. So again, just some numbers. Um, 870 million data points are consumed by the system a day, mm. right? So different things are interrogated at different rates. And I really enjoyed the comment Jeff made. If we know something's idle, well, I don't need to, you know, interrogate that second by second or you know subsets of seconds. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's idle, uh, but there are things that I do need that level of intensity. Leak detection. Asset integrity, right? Mm -hmm. But now when I get into looking for flow assurance issues and hydrates, uh, the cadence of those issues is on a much different uh, rhythm. And so again, the 870 million data points that we consume on a data, uh, daily basis have, have all uh, been defined so that the, the interrogation is driven by the information that we need to act on, very much so. Um, we run something like 430,000 calculations, or excuse me, analyses every day. Uh, each analysis could have anywhere from 30 to 150 calculations. Again, depending on the, the level of sophistication that the particular analysis calls for. Um, so that's, that, that's, how, that, that's how the sensor network is set up, how we consume data or the volume of data that we consume. What happens at that point is, is, is then we surface, again, these anomaly, uh, anomalies in that integrated production system, be it, a, be it a subsurface issue where we might not be providing sufficient water injection to maintain pressure in the reservoir, if it's a well issue where uh, a completion may be sanding up, or, or the uh, delta P, the, 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 the difference in pressure between the reservoir and, and inside the well may be too great, and we could be pulling much too hard on the well, risking failure of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the completion design. Uh, so 
so again, we're looking at the subsurface, we're looking at the wells, and then we're looking at all the top size equipment. Surfacing when performance is outside of a targeted operating envelope. Again, going back to all of the models that have been set up for, you know, if, if the well is at this stage of its life, you know, and, it's, uh, and the reservoir pressure is X, we know that it should be operating at this level. And, uh, or, if it's a, or if it's a compressor, uh, uh, or if it's a separator. We've got all of the equipment defined within certain tolerance levels, operating uh, conditions, and then we're looking for deviations outside of a, uh, of a known window, looking for trends before actually we, we, we get the deviation. All of that information then gets presented, if you move all the way to the far right of that screen on the bottom, uh, into this control tower. Uh, we brand it the bridge. So our deep water mm -hmm. control towers are, are called the bridge. These are these uh, large collaboration centers where we have operational personnel sitting alongside of a set of multidisciplinary engineers, again, looking at and monitoring this, uh, this massive uh, deep water operation uh, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico down in Brazil. And so it's, it's sort of, uh, I apologize, uh, probably poorly represented there, uh, but over on the far right, the bottom, you see one of the major uh, alert consoles that are on display uh, in, in the bridge center in New Orleans. So people, uh, management, uh, senior management can walk into that, that, that facility, and in many respects it, it would be, uh, walking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, where you could get sort of an instant feel of, of what's going on in our deep water operations. What are the major issues uh, that are occurring at a well level, at a reservoir level, at an equipment level? Where do we have major threats in the system? Do we then have the right uh, supply uh, suppliers lined up to do the requisite re remediations? We could be doing a lot more in that space. Um, certainly, I think that's where we could drive some of this in the future. Uh, but in terms of how the system uh, operates today, uh, this, is how, uh, this is how we've gone about ar uh, architecting the system. One of the knock-on benefits is we've been able to really get much more efficient in the, in the utilization of our personnel. So uh, one of the analogies we, we like to point to, you know, is, is sort of in the medical profession, nurses, you, you know, generalists and, and uh, specialists. Well, you, you, when, when you walk in w with an issue or you do your routine checkup, you know, a neurosurgeon is not conducting that analysis. You know, they're not taking your pressure. And, and what we found mm -hmm. in many cases was people with deep subject matter expert in, uh, again, looking at how uh, uh, a certain reservoir should get, was doing some very rudimentary analyses. We've been able to really optimize the use of personnel across the... Uh, and cross our entire fleet of operations. Yeah. So, no, that's fabulous. Thank you. Well, let's see what our next question is here. Um, yeah, I just want to dig a little bit deeper into the solutions, how you actually use them, sort of the key features, what makes them tick, you know? Uh, you can imagine if, if there's a tool in place that is screening 10 billion web pages a day connected to uh, different kind of sources and databases from the World Bank and United Nations and insurance companies, uh, that there are quite a bit of uh, alerts coming in every day. Um, so that's the reason why we also in our organization created the role of a risk manager, and he's actually here in the room, Jake. Um, we are. We are bundling these uh, risk alerts coming from our different sources, mainly from, from risk methods, our, our main partner. And based on their risk alerts, we are basically starting standard protocols we have defined to manage these cases. Um, one thing that we have to understand, and, and you could see that on that previous slide because there was a pictogram of a, of, of, of a human, human being, risk management, even if you start to automate all this uh, stuff, um, risk management is and will be always based on on human beings as well. So uh, we talked a lot about Internet of Things uh, the last two days and also today. Um, in this case, one of the things is also still the human being. So um, mo most of the risk cases I have seen in my life uh, are not only coming from whatever kind of database. Uh, 
It is coming from the employees because they usually have very strong relationships with their suppliers. They usually know what's going on. Um, if you have uh, supplier development people in your organization, they are usually very well connected to, uh, to the quality people at the suppliers. And sometimes there's even something like a friendship where you get some information. So we are pulling everything together in our systems. Um, information we, were, we are getting from the partners and even information we are getting from our employees. Um, what you see here on the screen is one of the standard uh, risk alerts we are getting. This is uh, showing a fire we had this uh, in summer last year. One of our key suppliers uh, had a fire and uh, this, had, this affected three or four of our plants. Um, it, was it was part of the hydraulic system. Um, we knew about the fire, I guess, 40, 45 minutes after it has started. Um, Usually the company owners don't call you and or don't call the major suppliers uh, when something happens like this. So we knew it because it was published on a small German local newspaper uh, already 30 minutes after the fire broke out and 45 minutes later we had it on our desk. So what we did in this case, um, we nominated one person in our global purchasing organization who of course was located in, in Markt Oberdorf uh, in Germany. He uh, got all the authority to manage this case. He got in the car, drove to this place, met with the owners, and then it took him almost four to five months, and he's still working on it to manage this case. But, but at least it shows you uh, how important it is to, to get these kind of alerts, because the earlier you can react, the smaller the damage will be. And our advantage was also uh, advantage um, with our competitors here. Uh, we had a person on site very quickly and a person who established a relationship with the company owners who also offered help um, so that we had this issue, yes, but it did not cause a financial problem for the company. It did not cause a delivery problem for the company. The only thing we had to do is we had to uh, change a little bit the sequence of our tractor manufacturing in Europe, but that was basically the only damage. and. Um, Again, it is important that you have these alerts, but even more important is how to deal with these alerts. And if you do not have standard protocols in place, clear roles and responsibilities in the organization, um, then uh, it doesn't make sense to receive these alerts. That's beautiful. Thank you. Great. So this is a, uh, an example of our, uh, it, this is a real time uh, tracking technology for marine pack cargo. Um, so if the, the little silver device down in the center is a, a cellular-based uh, GPS tracking device, uh, it, it contains a number of different sensor, uh, sensors on this particular technology. So uh, this uh, was implemented uh, for a, a security tracking uh, program uh, for a, a toxic inhalation hazard product uh, that moved between California um, in, in China as well as, as uh, various uh, uh, locations uh, throughout. So Hawaii was a, a very large customer. Uh, the state of Hawaii was a, a large customer of this. And so ultimately it gave us that real-time visibility uh, into the movement of the goods. Uh, as part of this, it, it was an event largely driven by event management. And as Jan said, there was a, a global team uh, with the uh, authority to take action upon this. And so uh, various temperature tracking technology. So when you look at, um, this was cellular based, uh, it did tie into the AIS message on the vessels. Um, so we were able to get uh, real time visibility in a dynamic ETA. Um, we would get uh, time fenced or geo fenced alerts. So when it would uh, be received into the port of Honolulu as an example, uh, we were able to get an update. Um, we would also have the ability to uh, have, have our freight forwarder updated who would take care of that load once it was um, uh, brought into the port. Uh, one example, and I think I have it on here, I, I'm not sure if, if that's the exact alert, um, but uh, we had a 16G shock alert uh, for a, a container coming into the port of Honolulu. Um, and 16Gs is a fairly large uh, shock. And so what ended up happening uh, was the, uh, the port operator dropped a container off of the, the vessel and it, it bounced on the, uh, the tarmac. And so 
we were able to alert the freight forwarder as this is a was a toxic inhalation product that you know take precaution uh, in addition uh, to your typical personal protective equipment uh, you will want more uh, more uh, to take additional safety precautions so um, it allowed us to, to respond and react properly to this um, uh, we also now leverage this and, and have the ability to update route times uh, for long sea voyages um, as well as as uh, from a, a security standpoint there's light sensors so we can see uh, when a particular container has been opened so once again in in a port uh, for customs clearance it's not uncommon for a, a container to be opened in the middle of the pacific ocean we have questions for that vessel operator if a, a particular shipment is is uh, tampered with so um, a lot of capabilities and, and Jan made a great point it's getting the people in the right in the right places to to react or, or to take the right actions based on these alerts um, and, and we've seen in the past uh, uh, from GPS tracking technologies on a, another asset set where um, we put the technology in place it worked very very well um, we were able to right size that fleet and then no one looked at the data again once we right-sized the fleet. And, and so it's how do you build the organization uh, around these technologies, not just uh, putting it in place and forgetting it. Thank you. And Tom. Okay, great. So I really enjoyed Jan's, uh, your comments around, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, certainly easy to raise alerts and surface alerts and alarms, but then what? What do you do about them? So having clarity around uh, roles and responsibilities and uh, required actions was what was something we absolutely wanted to address in this solution that, that we implemented uh, in our deep water line of business. So if I may, with the slide up here, just uh, take the, uh, take the uh, group through uh, uh, a couple of definitions, how, we, uh, how we've defined things inside of Shell. Uh, for this solution and, uh, and, then, and then talk about what it looks like in practice. So as I've been mentioning this morning, you know, the solution was predicated on extending very traditional procedures and practices in a control room type of environment, operational control and monitoring into the engineering sector. Uh, and again, that's what you see, you know, d down at the bottom uh, left, where you where you see the cadence of work activities, right? And so, in that epicenter there, is the monitoring, operational control, right? Things that occur within the day, seconds, hours, and then as you move out, now you start talking about analyses, reaction times that are more on the order of days and weeks. These are the analytics, the diagnostics, the interpretation activities that largely get done by engineering personnel. Uh, and this is where our solution is based. Again, extending traditional control room procedures and practices into that next sector. Ultimately, we can talk about activities that go on in terms of optimizing, planning, development activities that go on out in the field. But as we thought through that solution and thought, thought through the cadence of work as it occurred over a time frame with certain roles and responsibilities, one of the things we wanted to be clear about was language so that we were all speaking the same words. So alarms are different from alerts, events are different from alar uh, alerts, and services is something else. So let's, let me walk you through that. An alarm, again, is uh, something that is an operational notification. Again, that's where we, the, the, the very uh, tried and true operational control situation. It requires immediate attention. It's urgent, it requires intervention. It, typically, we're talking about the safe operation of equipment, so exceeding threshold levels, et cetera. That's an alarm. An alert is an engineering notification. So those are the anomalies that get surfaced through all of the calculations and analytics I talked about in our bridge solution, in our 
uh, control tower visibility solution. So it's a parameter that is trending outside of a desired operating. So it's developing condition, it's a threatening condition, but it's something that requires interpretation and diagnostics, right? It is not something that requires the immediate attention, uh, the safety of personnel or equipment is not at risk. But what is at risk is, is, uh, is financial returns, uh, that we will lose throughput, we will lose operating efficiencies if we don't deal with these issues in a timely manner. An event is either a single or a combination, uh, a, a combination of several alerts that indicate a certain type of a production anomaly. So this could be, as I was describing earlier, something related at the reservoir level, insufficient water injection that will ultimately impact recovery efficiencies or production volumes down the road, days, weeks, months. Uh, it could be a well production anomaly, uh, or it could be a piece of equipment either on the seafloor or on our top sides. And then a service. So a service is when we decide that that anomaly is something that needs required action. And so now we get into the clarity of roles and responsibilities. And so each service has a standard operating procedure. Again, trying to extend uh, language and terminology that was very familiar in our, in our controls operational maintenance business into the engineering sector. So uh, again, when we looked at uh, all of the work that gets executed, there are things that we could certainly do if we wanted to drive the kinds of efficiency that were possible through the system, we would standardize the response mechanisms so that it wasn't dependent on what someone thought the right thing to do to deal with a hydrate was based on the training classes that, that they, they did or the people within the company that they happened to know. So we made all of that collaboration, all of the uh, response mechanisms, what additional models needed to be uh, potentially run, standardized, so it gets called up in the system. So when, once you say I have, I have this type of event and, it, and I've connected it to this service that I want executed, well then it has to get done. And, and, then, and, then, and then the system from a traceability standpoint requires all steps to be followed through, all the way through the tracking of closing it out and, and uh, what value did we capture or what value did we avoid potentially threatening. So this is how we have approached um, uh, the solution uh, to make sure that it just wasn't about analytics, it just wasn't about surfacing alerts, but it was also about clear roles and responsibility and standardizing the actions to remediate those threats. Beautiful, thank you very much. Oh, we got some builds here, here we go. Let's talk about uh, benefits. We've talked about it a little bit, but um, you know, if we could go into it a little bit more. And uh, let's start with AGCO, even though we, we don't have an AGCO slide. Uh, let's, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, there was a reason why I didn't provide a slide, because if it comes to supply chain risk management, of course you can waste your time and building up lots of business cases and explain the organization how important it is, or you just do it. I think if you are in the 21st century in a modern supply chain organization, if you again understand that 70% of your success is coming from your, sub uh, from your suppliers and their sub-suppliers, is a very natural thing to spend some time on this uh, topic and to also spend some money on this topic. We, we have learned our lessons. We had some events in the previous years where we definitely paid some money because we were not prepared. We were not prepared in terms of uh, transparency and risk identification, and we were not prepared in terms of managing these risk events. Um, so there were cases that we used also to sell our approach, our solution. Um, we also tried to understand, uh, can we do an ROI analysis here? Can we come up with a fancy business case? At the end of the day, at least in this area, it is just putting some high potential, uh, not high potential, but hypothetical numbers together. And we, we decided, come on, let's skip it, let's go ahead, and let's show the first successes. And we had this very nice success with this example I just showed you with the company Hydeck with the fire. Um, here we had early identification, here we had a 
fantastic standard protocol in place and we had people in place that were managing the case so that at the end of the day um, we, we did not see any financial losses and, and with that we had basically our business case in place. Yeah, it's, it's really tough to put an ROI on risk management because you, you have an event that's unlikely to occur, but if it does, it can be catastrophic. And um, so it's easy for management to think, well, it's just unlikely that that's going to happen. But they don't think about all the things that could happen, and something is going to happen. And I guess that was also the good thing for us was yeah. we, we started very proactively. So uh, you saw the picture yeah. earlier where we invited our cross-functional partners already very early in the process. And this also helped us a little bit uh, because they got scared. They figured out, oh, uh, it's not only about buying. It's not only about teaming up with suppliers and then the world is great. It's really about there is, there is some potential risks out there. And it had really, it, it really helped us a little bit to scare the people. So we, we, uh, and sometimes it helps to scare people because then suddenly they change from opponents to proponents. And I guess that, that was in that area maybe a smart move that we did, uh, that we made it a company topic and not just the guys from purchasing deal with it. Yeah. So we're going to move on from Agco to Dow, and we're, we're going to hear um, Jeff's perspective on this. Yeah. So it. There's uh, underlying, and we had to come up with the ROI use cases uh, around logistics visibility. Um, and, and so there's many different levers, as I mentioned earlier, that, that once we have this visibility, we can pull. Um, unfortunately, we can't share them, uh, but I'll, I'll give you a, a tactical example. Um, this was uh, four months or, or three months after we had implemented or started the implementation of the solution. So uh, we had a, a handful of our uh, Dre partners as well as our uh, carriers on board the platform at this point and uh, we received a call from the freight forwarder that the uh, Maersk Jubilee had 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 a fire and was essentially floating uh, in the Atlantic Ocean um, uh, basically uh, not moving and so uh, typically what would happen is is we would work through we would we would go back in we would work with our uh, uh, freight forwarder with our dray carriers with the in this instance it was uh, also with the railroad um, and then ultimately uh, with the port and the ocean carrier so it, it would take several days to be able to track down what containers were impacted and even what was the volume of containers on a particular vessel mm -hmm. um, with the solution we were able to log in and literally within five minutes uh, we had a list of of the containers that were on that vessel um, we didn't know how long that would that vessel would be inoperable, and so we were able to, uh, with our business teams, then proactively reach out to the customers uh, and take the appropriate actions, reallocate, uh, look at, you know, how do we get sources of supply if they're getting close to running down um, and, and shutting down production in a given facility. And so rather than the that uncomfortable call of where's my stuff, we were able to proactively reach out uh, we knew what products, we knew uh, what orders, um, and, and what the status of that particular shipment was, and then could work with the, the customer in a proactive manner to, to resolve the situation, which uh, was a, a step change in, in, the, uh, in the way we typically would have operated in the past. It, it would have taken us days. We would have had customers calling, were you impacted? Um, and, and from a, a personnel, I think that's a, a great point. We were able to, to reduce the noise um, with our customers, with our carriers, with our partners to, to go and, and be more productive. And so I, I think that's an important piece that, that this does allow you to focus on those issues versus always being in a, in a fire drill uh, um, hypothetically. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier, you, you've tried to move beyond just uh, taking costs out of a supply chain. Uh, again, you know, the ROI around customer satisfaction is something a lot of companies struggle with doing, but there's no doubt that it results in market share and, and value to the corporation. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, packaging and performance plastics is one of our largest businesses. Uh, you know, Diego doesn't throw out comments all that often, and he was one of the, the presidents that came to me and said, Jeff, Amazon can do this. PepsiCo and Lay's knows where every bag of chips is on the store shelf. Come on, guys, let's get this thing going. So 
um, it, it, it's a different conversation um, when, when you enable these capabilities. Yeah. And Tom, I don't know if we have a slide for you or not. No. Oh, oh I've got one more. So one just more another slide. example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tropical Storm Bill, uh, which uh, came on uh, this summer, uh, we were able with our rail visibility network, uh, we're able to overlay the, the floodplain and the, the point of impact for this particular storm. It, it ended up not being as, as bad as we anticipated, but 36 hours before the storm hit land, we were able to determine what rail cars were in the region and were in the floodplain. Um, and then our, our rail logistics and our North America rail team were able to, once again, take the proactive measures to deal with the situation. Um, now, you can't take a rail car off of the tracks and move it you know, out of that floodplain, but at least we have um, a, an identification of, of what is impacted. We can get the right information out to our partners and, and carriers um, to see what, uh, what can we proactively do. Um, and in the Gulf Coast region, there's many different sources of supply, so we can, we can manage that uh, once we have that insight. And we're going to move to Tom and Shell. Oh, wait a second. Well, yeah, we, no, yeah, yeah. We, we didn't, uh, I was yeah. unable to provide a slide here yeah. on, uh, on the value discussion. I'll say a few words. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sensitive uh, uh, topic for, for us. It's um, sensitive in, 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 the, in the way that uh, uh, we don't like to speak uh, externally about it. We do believe that this visibility control tower solution is a differentiator for us, uh, is, is, is a truly uh, uh, key enabling uh, capability that, that, that is producing uh, uh, significant returns, adding to the bottom line uh, in terms of ROI. What, what I can say, and I think you know, I've hinted at this in, in terms of how we've been able to, to, to bring forward um, uh, all of the analytics in a much more efficient, effective manner uh, we do track things like deferred production volumes, up times on all of our equipment. We have been able to see noticeable changes in those metrics with uh, the startup of this capability. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the investment that we made, we, we don't even like to describe that, so, but you know, roughly on the order of tens of millions of dollars was what the investment in the capability. So. The, the analytics engine, uh, all of the work to architect it, connect everything up, uh, the physical facility itself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In, in terms of how many times uh, uh, we've, we've, we've delivered a return on that investment, it's, you know, depending on what you're looking at, you know, 5x to, you know, 10x. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a true force multiplier a, a, across our business. And, and whether we're talking about production volumes, whether we're talking about recovery efficiencies out of the reservoir, whether we're talking about uh, the more efficient uh, delivery of uh, a myriad of supplies, chemical injection delivery through uh, subsea uh, umbilicals, uh, all of these things have seen, ha have seen improvements in our operation. And, 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 and this notion of traceability that I described earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the standard operating procedures, executing uh, the, 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 the service operating procedure following uh, the, the determination that we've got an event, we, 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 we track that all the way through, in, including value. So, so we track you know, how much production was saved or how much chemical was avoided uh, delivering uh, downhole, et cetera. So, right. yeah. so this, is, this is one area where, um, where you can put value on it, right? I right. mean, you... you uh, Asset uptime means, and, and better production means money. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. I mean, not surprisingly, yeah. those yeah. are the cheapest barrels we produce, right? The capital yeah. investment has already been made. Yeah. Uh, the operating costs are getting spent on a daily basis. Yeah. More barrels through the system that should be produced, those are the cheap, cheapest uh, barrels we can deliver uh, ultimately through, the, th through to the end customer. Yeah. No, 5 to 10x your investment. That's fabulous. And so we were going to move on. We were going to talk a little bit about if other companies here in the audience were thinking about tackling visibility, what should they think about? So sort of the hard-learned lessons of some of the, the folks up here. I, I will keep it short. I mean, 
implementing something like a risk management approach is not really just buying a tool. I mentioned that earlier. Um, it is a change management project that's very simple, and you need to run it like a change project. Yeah, you need to convince people to follow. You need to convince people that now and in the future, their work is slightly different than uh, what they have done in the past. Yeah? Usually in, in purchasing organizations, buyers are focused on cost down. They, they believe they are the strongest negotiators on this planet, but they never have risk on their mind, at least not in the past. So um, the, the lessons learned here for us were very, very simple. Um, make sure that you create some kind of an awareness, make sure that everyone in the organization, not only the people who report to you or are part of your organization, uh, understand that this topic is high priority. Uh, make sure that you work on your data uh, so that the data you are feeding into the system is, uh, is accurate. So we spent at least six to eight months with, with some people and a lot of money to clean up our supplier master data to really also understand where are, what are our suppliers, where are they located, what is their physical address. Uh, I mean, that was a very nice experience when you work with a tool like Risk Methods and you present them your master data and th that's based on, on coordinates and uh, suddenly you find uh, your, one of your suppliers in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean because the master data is not correct, then you know that there is a problem. Yeah. Um, so. And finally, what we did, we invested even more money on the training than we invested in the tools. Uh, because we wanted to make very clear to the organization that everybody is part of this approach and not a tool, it's, a, an, a, it's an approach. And that everybody has to deliver and everybody has to make sure that whenever there's a decision to be made, sourcing decision, supplier decision, um, that this is not only based on costs or price, it's based on more factors, um, which also includes the risk environment. Thank you, and we'll, we'll t see if we have a slide for, for Dow here. No, let's, we don't, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and have uh, Jeff, Jeff answer this as well. Yeah, so uh, Jan hit on a, a key piece, uh, yeah. is the data quality. Um, so there's, there's data all over, um, and, and our number one pushback uh, when, when we put these solutions forward is we already have the data. Um, we have it in our master data, we have it in our ERP systems, and so the, the opportunity is can we access it and can we uh, make better business decisions? So it, it, the quality of the data is, is always a challenge. Um, when we talk supply chain data, much of this data is outside of our fence line. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does come in eventually, or at least key pieces of it come in from a, a financial transaction standpoint. Um, but there's a lot more granularity we need when we operate a supply chain. And so it's, it's how do we work with our carriers on the data quality? How do we work on the timeliness of that data entry, especially on the, the business to business uh, communication piece and then on the real time it's getting your in aligning to to what is usable data versus just collecting it to collect it um, the the other piece uh, and, and Jan hit on this as well as is, is the change management um, within Dow we've built an organization uh, to implement these solutions as well as is uh, we know the organization will change especially as we look end to end so what are those trade-off decisions that you can make uh, in the event of a, a port shutdown? What, what can we do and who makes those decisions? Is it the logistics function? Uh, is it the business supply chain? Is it some combination? Um, and Steve, I loved your uh, slide on, on what is a control tower. So one of the biggest challenges is where do you enable that, that decision making to happen? So. By definition, the control tower is a central location, but there's many geographical differences uh, uh, in how those decisions are made. And then for Dow, we layer in a business, which also has that, that supply chain segmentation and how we prioritize, um, and no one likes to hear that, but how we prioritize those shipments in an event. And so um, how do we enable that and how do we push that decision making to the right level uh, within the organization. Tom? 
Yeah, great, great, great comments already made by uh, by Jan and Jeff on this uh, on, on this question, Steve. Uh, uh, but I'll just run through. You know, f from from my perspective, the journey that that we shell went on in in implementing our solution. Things to keep in mind: um, absolutely, the, the the data is uh, first and foremost right there. So, you know, how are you going to manage it? How are you going to collect it? How are you going to interrogate it? How are you going to store it? Just thinking. Uh, that data strategy all the way through with these solutions is is absolutely critical. A clear and compelling business case, right? So it's not just the technology mm -hmm. that's easy to become enamored with and web pages mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. control rooms and, and consoles and so forth, but what, what what is that clear and compelling business case and what are we going to do with this technology and how is it going to change and impact the operation? Uh, the change thir journey, I heard Jan make uh, several comments on, on, the, on the change journey. I think we've got a question coming up on that, so maybe I'll save some of my comments there. Uh, the fourth one is, is partners. So who do you need to be on this journey with? And that's both internal and external partners. Uh, internally, IT, our IT organization, was, was clearly uh, a, a needed partner um, to be seen that way. Uh, and then externally, well, certainly there are transactional folks, but, I, but I'm talking more, more about the thought leaders out there in this space, in the Internet of Things space, uh, th that are going to take you on this journey and, and, and can understand your business. And uh, a key one for us in this regard was Honeywell, and I, and I know uh, mm -hmm. there's probably a Honeywell uh, uh, some of the folks sitting out there in the audience, uh, they've been fabulous in in, in really climbing into our problem and, and, and talking about how we can, uh, you know, take solutions and apply them uh, to what we're attempting to do. So well, those it, would be my four. Yeah, and Tom, what struck me when I, when I listened to your, your presentation, you, you had this uh, topology of uh, alerts, alarms, services, but it just sounded like a massive amount of work to think through all the things that could happen and then act upon them, and it doesn't sound like that journey ever ends. No, it, it absolutely doesn't. Um, and you know, this is where we we, we tap into the the, the importance of a, a change journey and bringing people along on on that journey, uh, because roles will change. Um, uh, people get obviously, I mean, yeah. human nature threatened. Does this mean decision making? Yeah. To, to Jeff's point, is going to be consolidated and. Is some control tower? Am I going to, you know, is mm -hmm. Big Brother going to be watching and checking whether I'm making proper decisions? You know, so lots of those emotional decisions uh, that, that absolutely have to be respected, recognized, and, and jointly, jointly work through. Um, when, when you're putting in the level of technology and the level of workflow rigor that we really wanted to uh, uh, transform the, the, uh, by, by taking the company on this journey. So it doesn't, it, it absolutely doesn't end, right? Yeah. It absolutely doesn't end. They continue to think about where they want to extend it more deeply into the supplier network, more deeply into areas of risk management and our HSSE, health, safety, mm -hmm. uh, and environmental performance. I mentioned leak detection earlier. Um, so the journey is, uh, is far from over. Yeah. Well, and unfortunately, uh, we're out of time here. But I, I just want to thank our gentlemen. And uh, I thought this was fantastic content. And I want to uh, send a special thanks to Tom. Tom flew uh, out to Norway shortly before this, this uh, happened. I wasn't sure Tom was going to make it back. And I'm amazed that he seems awake and alert. And uh, so, But anyway, let's give our, our, our panelists great, a great hand. Here.